In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So I have something that gets in my crawl probably more than it should. Uh, bottled water. I was committed when I came here not to change too much of what was going on and uh, not to mess with the liturgy or uh, the way things operated until I got to really know the system. Uh, but one of the things I struggled with was how ubiquitous water bottles were around here, and it was great hospitality. Uh, so one of the first things I did was that we were going to get rid of all these water, water bottles. Uh, you know, I drink water so fast that it seems incredibly wasteful when I'm already uh, done the water bottle and think of all the energy that went into producing that little bottle. Uh, and then, like I said, I'm as wasteful as the next, but that's just one visible sign that sort of uh, hits me. Uh, and I was thinking about that as I picked up my uh, children from camp and uh, we went to uh, my in-law's house and uh, it's so much more convenient just to take a whole bunch of uh, water bottles uh, since we're going out in the boat and they all had their water bottles. and. Uh, I noticed at the end of the night there was about nine water bottles on the counter, all with about this much gone from them. Uh, and I asked them which one was whose, and they had <coughs> very little idea. And so finally I said, all right, you're going to claim one, and you're not going to relinquish it until it's done. Uh, you can put your name on it, you're carrying it with you. Uh, but I was getting a little over the top about these water bottles. Um, and I, I also, if I'm going to be totally honest, I also have a tough time with uh, folks that that struggle with drinking this water or that water. I prefer the flavor of this water or uh, that tap water doesn't taste just right. And I think, you know, it is an amazing gift that we have that we have drinkable water that is safe to drink. Uh, it is an enormous commodity. And because we've always, for most of us, always had it at our disposal, we can be critics about whether this perfectly drinkable water that sustains life is as good as this drinkable water that sustains life. And many uh, don't have that opportunity. Uh, for many, uh, water is an incredibly difficult asset to come across. Um, and uh, for many, it's very complicated uh, how water comes into their, uh, into their community. Uh, and I think that because we've been so desensitized to real visceral thirst, uh, and scarcity of water, uh, that water has lost some of its meaning and some of its potency. Uh, and I, I, I think that's, uh, that's damaging. There are moments, like when we pour water into uh, this font, where we appreciate it all over again, the power of water. Uh, I was struck with an account that Helen Keller shares about uh, how instrumental water was in her transformation. Uh, uh, struck. Uh, because of illness, uh, both deaf uh, uh, and blind at about 18 months old, she was uh, an incredibly difficult child. She was incredibly rebellious. She was angry. Uh, she really struggled. Uh, and her parents uh, tried to just about anything. And they finally uh, partnered with a school, a Perkins school up in Boston. And they got uh, Ann Sullivan to come down and, and, and stay on their farm in Alabama, I believe. Uh, and, and try to help her uh, be able to, uh, to manage, to be able to develop coping skills, to be able to learn uh, how to live more fully and more, uh, uh, and, and, and more uh, vivaciously uh, in, 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 in the accommodations that she had. And uh, she recalls this moment, this transforming moment that took place at a pump house on the property uh, and said uh, that as Ann Sullivan uh, was, was pumping water, and uh, she put uh, Helen's uh, hand under uh, the spout in one hand, as the water dripped through her fingers, uh, she wrote the word water on the other hand. And she said that she felt that refreshing, cool sensation of water, uh, this incredible thing uh, sliding between her fingers uh, while the word was being spelled on the other hand, that she realized uh, that everything has a name and, uh, uh, and, and, and that that began the process of her learning uh, how to connect uh, all of these different ideas to sensations, to words. Uh, but she said she never will forget the sensation of water that had such a transforming uh, effect on her lives. Uh, and I think we do have a habit of forgetting uh, that initial contact with something, especially if we've never, never known its absence. Uh, I think uh, faith can be the same way. Uh, I remember, uh, despite being raised in the church, that I had an incredible moment of faith. That uh, um, I was in high school, and uh, part of the charismatic movement in the Episcopal Church started things like Curcio, uh, but also uh, for high school, there's this thing called Happening. And it was a wonderful celebration 
of God's love for you. You were showered with gifts and with uh, love from people you never even met before, and you just were so wrapped in God's love, and it pulled on every emotional heartstring, and you went away absolutely filled to the brim uh, with a sense of God in your lives. Uh, but the problem was uh, it didn't dig deep enough roots. And as soon as life got difficult, as soon as things didn't work out the way that uh, they seemed like they should, as soon as uh, you started having questions, there wasn't the substance behind it uh, to allow you to grow and to continue uh, when, when life got difficult. Uh, I think sometimes we forget those first moments of joy in our faith. Uh, I've shared the story before of these missionaries that went uh, over to a remote island uh, where they had never, ever, ever heard the Bible. And they'd never had any contact with the gospel. And as they were telling the gospel, each day uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the community would get there earlier and earlier. They would tell it in a little amphitheater they created right in the middle of the village. Uh, and each day they, they would get there earlier and earlier to get a good seat to hear what was going to happen next. And as they got closer to Jesus going to Jerusalem, uh, all the questions that uh, would last the whole day through. People would come up to him and say, well, well, what's going to happen next? He should go to Jerusalem. You know, that's going to be dangerous. Uh, but nothing could happen to Jesus. And then as they got even, even closer uh, to, the, to Jesus being arrested, uh, they just were getting peppered with questions. And people would show up hours or two hours early uh, to get the seat at the amphitheater, waiting to see what would happen. And then as the skies turned black on, on Friday and they... Uh, they told the story of Jesus dying, there was wailing and, and a kind of grief and a visceral response uh, that no matter how beautifully we, uh, we recreate Good Friday liturgies uh, isn't the same as hearing it for the first time. Uh, and uh, they were beside themselves. Uh, and the missionaries hardly got any sleep that night because uh, people kept coming uh, uh, to, their, uh, to their tent and, and saying, this can't be, this can't be. Uh, and by the time they got to Sunday and they told the story of the empty tomb, uh, there was a joy and a lightness and a celebration uh, that, that Easter, uh, even as glorious as we do it, uh, uh, can't contain. It was so overwhelming uh, because it was that first encounter uh, but one of the things that we need to do, uh, we need to do for ourselves, and we need to do for uh, the generations to come, uh, is to help take those incredible experiences and dig them deeper, to give root uh, to those encounters of knowing that God is in our lives. Uh, and, and sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes adversity, which is what Jesus was facing uh, when Jesus writes his gospel account, uh, is easier to face uh, than complacency and comfort. Uh, sometimes those are more threatening uh, to, to really deepening our, uh, our trunk, deepening our roots uh, the, than adversity. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we take the youth on the mission trip. They did such a wonderful job last week talking about their experience. Uh, but I want to tell you a little bit more about why we go there. It is probably the least efficient way uh, to do material good in a place uh, that I could come up with. Uh, the, uh, the bus alone probably costs more than... Uh, than the cost benefit of the material good that we do there, to be honest. Uh, uh, and if, I, if you heard me calling it a bus, it's a coach. Uh, the coach. Uh, but we don't go there for the material good we do. That's a wonderful byproduct. It's a wonderful thing we do. Uh, but we go there for a countless other reasons that are far more important. Uh, we go there to deepen roots. Uh, we go there to stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters whose lives uh, look a lot different than our own. Uh, we go there to see how people who have really faced adversity uh, can grow such deep roots, and hopefully that takes, takes us to a deeper place, to a place where we, uh, where we can deepen our faith. Uh, a little bit about the place that we go, and this is the stories that have been told to me over the years. Uh, Hollywood, South Carolina, uh, is a, a particularly poor town. It's a, uh, it's a town that's got a little bit of, of, of wealth in it, uh, but that wealth still doesn't raise the average income above 30000 So when you consider uh, some of these incredible houses that are on the golf courses and, and whatnot, and the average household income is 30000 you get a sense of what, um, of, of what the rest of the community lives like. It's 70% uh, African American, uh, and it's a, a community where a lot of the, uh, the land, it's, 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 at least as, as I've been told, uh, uh, was sold uh, or given to, uh, to, to free people in about the 1880s. Um, but it was uh, in such a way where the, uh, the deeds were very tenuous because they were passed from family to family through the generations. 
Uh, and as Charleston uh, is, is, is growing and has grown, as those resort communities of Kiwa and Edisto and Seabrook Island continue to flourish, uh, that people realized there was an opportunity here in Hollywood, uh, that they could go and uh, they could uh, 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 realize some of the deeds weren't as solid as they could be and, 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 and acquire land uh, to continue development. And people stood up and said, we need to fight against this, uh, this community that's been there for so long that they uh, speak even a different dialect. Uh, there's a Gullah uh, that, is, uh, 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 that is spoken in this community uh, that, really, uh, that really reinforces the fact that this community has been there for a long, long time. Uh, and so part of what we do is to help continue that community. Uh, but what transforms our young people, I believe, uh, is that they go and they experience people who have a well of faith that has been tested, that has been tested beyond all measure. They went and they worked on uh, Miss Clara's house. Uh, Miss Clara has lost more family members in the last year uh, than I've probably lost in my lifetime, uh, including children. Uh, she's, she's lost uh, over the years more than one son. Uh, uh, her family has been riddled with, uh, with drug addiction and other health issues. Uh, it uh, has been riddled with poverty. Her house was falling in on itself, and she prays uh, with a fidelity and a love of the Lord uh, that, that makes you just stand in awe. And you heard our young people talk about that experience and what it's like to stand uh, and hear her sing uh, and hear her talk about what it felt like, uh, what it feels like to know that God is in your life. Uh, and I think God registered a little bit more deeply with our young people because of it. Or we go and we go and you heard people talk about that seafood jamboree where we go and we hear from Linda Gadsden, uh, whose life has not been easy by any uh, measure, uh, uh, who has given her life towards transforming this community, uh, whose sons uh, have struggled with addiction, uh, who's, who's dealt with just about every obstacle uh, and seen every uh, ill in Hollywood uh, and yet still prays uh, and, 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 and sings and fills any room or any open space with a joy and an effervescent spirit and a, a, a presence of the divine uh, that transforms hearts and minds. So we take our young people there not just to build houses, uh, but to build deep roots, to understand a faith that can face complacency and comfort as well as adversity. Uh, and I think that's what Jesus knew his people were facing. Over the last several weeks, uh, we've heard about the fact that the disciples uh, were going to have to carry their cross, that uh, they were going to face persecution. In Matthew's time, they'd already faced that persecution. Uh, they were already being killed for their faith. Um, and they said, live a life that matters. Uh, carry your faith and realize it's going to take every ounce uh, of the faith that I've given you. I have cast seeds far and wide. I have given all of you that seed of faith that can, that, 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 that can grow into a beautiful tree, just the size of a mustard seed can grow into a beautiful tree, and I've given each of you that seed of faith. But you're going to need to nurture it. You're going to need to care for it. Because otherwise, it will wither and die, or it won't take seed, uh, and you will need it to take deep roots. Because when you're faced with adversity, when you're faced with complacency or comfort, uh, you'll need something deep enough to hold in order for it to transform your life, in order for you to be able to transform the lives of others, in order for you to break in uh, bits of heaven here on earth, you are going to need transforming love, transforming faith. And so take that seed. And it's worth noting that the part that would shock the people that first heard this parable uh, was the sower. He's the worst sower of all time. I mean, you don't waste seed on, on, on pavement. You don't waste seed on rocky soil. You don't waste seed uh, on things that won't take root. Uh, but God says no one is a waste of seed. No one is a waste of, of faith, of casting. Uh, God in hope gives all of us the opportunity to flourish. And we have to decide what kind of soil we want to be. What kind of soil we want to be for uh, those we're about to baptize, for our youth, uh, for ourselves, for our families, and for our parish family. Uh, and what kind of good do we want to do with that? How do we bring down bits of heaven like we did last week in South Carolina uh, with the kind of faith that God has given us? How do we nurture it so that we can transform? Because when we grow into those tall trees, our fruit feeds others and casts more seeds. And it continues to grow. Amen.